Hello, I'm Dr. Shlomit Shal, and I'm the Chief Physician Executive here at Houston Methodist. Welcome to our webcast, Women in Surgery. Today, I have the honor to host here, Dr. Lay. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me here on your show. It's been a, a great getting to know you, actually, this year. We'll talk about it a little bit uh, later, but first, tell me about yourself. Tell me and the audience. Who are you, Dr. Linda Lay? Uh, so I have been a vascular surgeon here for nine years, um, and it was my first and only job out of fellowship a long time ago. It's been a great experience. I'm originally from New Orleans, born and raised, and so I love those traditions. Um, but I also have now con consider myself a, a Texan, um, but have been... I also consider myself a Texan. Yes, yeah. Uh, it, <laughs> it, it definitely grows on you for sure. Um, and so I've been very happy here. Um, love, love. We have a residency and a fellowship. Um, and excited to be here to talk more about what it's like to be a woman surgeon. So what is vascular surgery? What do you actually do? Um, so that's a great question because many people, even in med school, do not know what we do. I, when I was a third year, just got placed on the vascular rotation as an elective. I had no idea what vascular surgeons do. And not until I was on the rotation did I realize what it was truly about. And, and to me, I look at it as we're the fire men and women of the hospital. So we do not only, um, you know, carotid disease, peripheral disease, but we also stop emergency bleeding. If there's clotting, aneurysms, it's a vast array of um, vascular diseases, mostly affecting older patients. And this field found you or you found the field? How, how did you come about to be a vascular surgeon? I think it found me, really. Um, so in med school, I had great mentors. Uh, they were a uh, husband and wife uh, uh, team. They were both vascular surgeons. And then the uh, chief of vascular surgery over there, uh, Dr. Batson, who's now Where is retired there? Uh, at LSU. Okay. New Orleans. Um, and now he's retired, but they were just great mentors to me. They let me do so much in the operating room. It was right after Hurricane Katrina. So talk about an experience that probably wow. most people would never get. Just the independence, um, the, the severity of illness, sort of like a COVID, just, you know, patients presenting later um, in their uh, stages of disease. And so it was a great experience. And then I went into general surgery residency, which again, vas the vascular surgeons found me. Again, they were my mentors. And so in my head, I went through many rotations, but in the end, it was always vascular surgery. So many people who are watching, some of them are in med school and they're thinking, can I even be a surgeon? And we're talking specifically about women. There are not many role models, especially in vascular surgery. I know the numbers nationally are 15% women. Yes. So it means 85% are not women. Not women. But, you know, we are one of the specialties that have made numerous strides recently in the last years. We have almost, we are now 50-50 in terms of integrative vascular. And so even though traditionally it's been mostly men in the next coming generations, it's going to probably be more women. So you're talking about fellows who are now in training? Fellows, yes. Young faculty, um, med students going into integrated residency. So we actually see more female candidates than we do male. And it's really now 50-50 in terms of trainees. So how did that happen from a field that is clearly male dominated. Now you're saying the trainees are now 50-50. Yeah. How did you make that happen in your field and how can we make it happen in other fields? Um, you know, I wish I knew the simple answer to that. Uh, it really happened pretty uh, recently, I would say. Um, there's probably multiple reasons. Our first female president of the Society of Vascular Surgery was, I think, in either 2013, around that that um, time period. But, you know, I don't think it was just her. I think also many of us have had many male uh, mentors that have been extremely supportive, have really given us the opportunity to become better leaders in the field. Um, so I think it's just an overall community, like the, all the vascular surgeons, everyone's uh, effort to make it more diverse. 
in this diversity in the profession, has it made the profession better? And in what ways, if it did? Um, it, I think it definitely has. It definitely has highlighted not only in clinical trials the um, inequality of, of clinical trials, both in, in cardiology, vascular surgery, that, you know, it, your best, your best is 30% female enrollment, right? Oh, wow. But that's that's not what the disease process is, you know? I mean, it, so it's never been 50-50, and I would say very few clinical trials have even gotten 30% of female um, participants. So it's, it's really highlighted that because there's been a big push in vascular surgery of research in gender inequality, not only in this, the field, but also in our patients, um, you know, in economic uh, disparities in different parts of the country, even like we've talked about vascular deserts before where the Midwest has very few vascular surgeons. So I think it's really given us quite a uh, clear picture of, of what we need to work on and what questions that we haven't answered yet. So you think that female patients, just from your own experience, are they perhaps more comfortable with female surgeons? I think so. I think that goes for any patient. I think patients in general feel comfortable if their doctor looks like them and whatever that is. Um, and also, I think for females, they usually are caregivers, so they may present later in their disease process because, you know, oh, they're taking care of this. They're always worried about somebody else until it really bothers them and then they come, right? So uh, we do notice um, that in vascular disease, females tend to present in later stages. Wow. Uh, is there a different like anatomical difference between men and women? Obviously, there's a difference in size of the blood vessels. Mm -hmm. Is Definitely. it easier or harder to do surgery, first of all, as a surgeon female? And then the second question is, as a patient, is it easier to operate on a woman or maybe more difficult because the blood vessels are smaller or maybe it doesn't matter? Um, so maybe for open, it, it doesn't. But I think for endovascular, it does. Um, there has been research published that actually show Asian uh, Pacific uh, Islanders, you know, um, and females have smaller iliac arteries. And so if you look at that, if you are doing any sort of advanced endovascular procedures, that might be more difficult, uh, which might lead to more complications. In terms of endovascular surgery, that doesn't matter if you're a man or um, a woman surgeon, right? It shouldn't. Um, it shouldn't. But, um, you know, for example, lead, we have to wear lead for that. That's mm -hmm. uh, pretty pretty heavy. Um, if you are short, the hybrid tables only go down to a certain a certain height, but then you all you can't really be on a step stool because you got to press the button, things, you know, the pedal and everything. Um, and then there was uh, this company, uh, which I won't name, but, um, you know, there's been uh, some product development like for weightless lead, right? So lead that is weightless so that you don't, you don't have that strain from wearing 20 pounds of lead. And they literally did not make it for anybody below five foot five. So wow. that was, that was literally all the women in our department. So no, we couldn't get weightless lead because they didn't, they didn't make those parts to make us the custom lead. That's interesting. That's yeah. actually reminded me of, uh, I have a, a female astronaut friend mm -hmm. and she said they don't make astronaut uh, suits for women. Mm -hmm. So they wear the men's suits. Right, right. Which is not that comfortable, especially if you're in space for a long time. Exactly, yeah. So you have the same uh, kind of problem and are you advocating to change that or is oh. it a, if you're going to be 50-50, it's going to be maybe easier to advocate for change in that uh, right. tire. Exactly, absolutely. So we definitely let the company know they were quite embarrassed. Hmm. Um, you know, we were not really, I mean, I wasn't offended. You don't, know what you don't know, right? So as long as they are open to criticism, to to comment like, oh, you know, hey, we didn't think to make parts for shorter individuals, maybe which shorter individuals tends to be women that oh, we should think about, you know, go back to research and development and sort of figure out a way to make this a little bit more equal in terms of 
body habitus, shall I say, you know, so um, as long as, you know, people are open, and, and that's actually, I've noticed that in a lot in vascular surgery is that there, there are a lot of men and older men in the field, and many times they are so open to you just being honest with them, um, and they just want to learn. They just want, like, how do you feel? Like, how, mm -hmm. you know, I, they can't say that they've ever been in our perspective, right? So they don't know what it feels like it, but as long as people are open, um, um, to understanding where each other come from. I think that's where like growth begins and diversity starts. And so I've always felt that vascular surgery, you know, everybody that does it, I mean, we're all different, but we're kind of the same thread that we're all pretty open and very um, just compassionate individuals. Fantastic. You know, so. And you're about 10 years into practice, you said, yeah. 9, 10 years. Yeah. And so this is really the beginning. Mm -hmm. How difficult it is to start a practice, specifically as a female surgeon? You know, I cannot comment on that because uh, when I came here, my partners on my second day of working gave me 10 cases <laughs> on the OR board. I did not even have um, scrubs yet or an ID. Um, and so, you know, the good thing about Houston Methodist is that, you know, e people really want, you know, patients really want to come here. And it's about the name, the quality of the product, right? And so I, it wasn't very difficult for me to build the practice. Um, and then I think as long as you are compassionate, you spend time with your patients, you give them a good result, then it's just word of mouth. And so that's really how I started a couple years ago. Fantastic. And how about uh, your uh, life at home? How does this work? You know, every time I go to a conference, people say, oh, what do you think about life work balance? And I don't like the word uh, balance. I like the word harmony. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with that harmony? I know you have a young uh, kid at home. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit more about that. You know, I think it's more about a yin and yang, kind of maybe similar to how you feel about harmony. Um, some moments in life require more time at home and some moments in life require more time at work. Um, I've always been a believer you can't have it all all at the same time. And so you just have to decide what your priorities are. And those priorities will change depending on like what what's going on in your life and what is needed. Um, and so that's sort of how I balance it. Uh, and are it you worried at home uh, at all that you're going to be less uh, progressing fast? And, you know, if you compare yourself to your men colleagues in terms of your professional career, just because you have a young kid and uh, perhaps a, a lot of duties at home. Yeah, I do. Um, I definitely do. I think, um, and we were talking about this earlier, like that mid-career, you know, and I, and I actually, my uh, webcast talked about that. It's like, you know, during this time, I feel like you're needed the most at home. And so somebody, you know, and, and again, like, it's not like I don't want to do that. I love being a mother. That's like my number one priority, right? Like if I had to pick, I would pick my family, obviously. But um, part of that is obviously you only have 24 hours in a day. And so where does that go to? And I do feel like some women struggle with that mid-career where they slow down because they're at a, a vital part of their life where they're needed at home more. And then by the time they're like, okay, I have more time, well, a lot of opportunities have passed that they might have you know, given up or turned down. And so then they don't come because there's other people that have fulfilled that job. So I don't really know. I don't have a good answer how to how to manage that yet or deal with that. I guess it'll just come somehow organically to me. Yeah, somebody no. told me always that you say, this is my number one priority. And then you check your schedule and then you see the the numbers of hours that you dedicate and then you realize what's your real number one priority. Do that it is tonight. true. <laughs> I will. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. I mean, what do you think about that whole like well, mid career. you know, for, for me, my kids are, are grown now. I have four and my little one is 26. Mm -hmm. Actually, yesterday was 26. Um, so long time have has passed. I think um, it's not a race. And mm -hmm. I think everybody has a their own path. And like you said, sometimes you're needed in critical points in, in life mm -hmm. at home. And you have to understand that and just 
gift to that. Uh, and I think men as well have that. Right, yeah. uh, and perhaps now it's more that our society is more forgiving to allow men to be uh, with their children, with mm-hmm. their spouses, with their older parents, mm-hmm. and not only put it uh, on, on women. So I, I hope that your generation has it better than mine. Mm-hmm. Uh, but just remember that it's not, not a race. You don't have to really. Yes, some people may pass you. But there is not really, you know, you're going to have your opportunities. And just make sure you say yes yeah. when you have those uh, opportunities. Yes. Yeah, that's great advice. You mentioned you had a webcast. Tell yes. us a little bit about it. Yeah, so you were on. You were one of the highlights on, on our recent shows. It's called um, Sisterhood in Surgery, and it's through the DeBakey CB Education. Uh, it's it's we've been doing it for three years now, maybe even longer, and we've done topics such as you know academic topics, uh, residency, medical student topics, wellness, uh, personal and social topics, even finance, um, you know, life insurance policies, things like that. It's been a great opportunity opportunity to actually meet many vascular surgeons, not only we, women, but men um, across the nation, especially. And then I also invite um, non-vascular surgeons, but wonderful people like you on the show. And so it's been a great um, social network for me. And I think it does help a lot of our viewers just realize they're not the only ones thinking about this topic that may be uncomfortable to talk about. So how did you come up with this idea? It was during COVID and you have a partner as well who is a vascular surgeon, partnered in crying for the webcast. Yes. So so Palma Shaw is my co-host. It actually started with my uh, chair, Alan Lumsden, who is really into video, loves, you know, we have all kinds of um, educational videos on our uh, doing surgery. um, And he runs a bunch of boot camps. And so he said to me, okay, well, nobody's followed a pregnant vascular surgeon before. So can the cameras follow you? And I wow. thought, well, what do, <laughs> like what happens when I'm done being pregnant? Does the show just end? And so then we sort of brainstormed and thought, okay, well maybe it'd be better if we do we can do a show about pregnancy, being pregnant during um, you know, residency or during being a faculty, but we should do other topics. And so that's sort of how it evolved. What was the most fun episode that you hosted? Uh, so the most fun, most intriguing was the episode on divorce because I felt like nobody talks about that topic, even though it happens. And we had uh, my chair, Alan Lumsden, like I said, and his divorce lawyer, um, wow. who was like one of the top divorce lawyers in Houston. And so it was just a, kind of a odd topic to talk about, but we learned a lot. And um, you, it, it was great to hear just things like I wouldn't even know I'm happily married, obviously, but um, to hear the emotional aspect of it, uh, of when a marriage falls apart and to hear it from my chair, who, you know, you see as like the strong male individual, right? So it was just a, um, a very, uh, a good show on a topic that's really kind of hush hush. That's interesting that you discuss divorce. Uh, what are the stressors in uh, cardiovascular surgery and vascular surgery that may lead to uh, a result like that? Um, I would think, you know, for our specialty, it's it's sort of known for longer hours um, due to, you know, lots of emergencies. You know, we ha- we do actually have a lot of emergencies as compared to other surgery, surgical fields. Um, and we have a lot of more urgent patients. You know, our patients are pretty sick. Actually, vascular surgery patients um, have a higher mortality rate than cancer patients. Um, because when, right? right when when it comes to vascular disease, if you have vascular disease, you usually have other diseases such as diabetes, um, heart disease, uh, you know, lung disease, uh, end stage renal. So all of those come with vascular disease. Um, so you know, it's it's a combination of everything that probably makes it a bit stressful to be a vascular surgeon. And you said a lot of emergencies. What kind of emergencies? Oh, well, let's start naming them. Um, Mesenteric ischemia, um, stroke, uh, ruptured uh, AAA, which is a ruptured aortic aneurysm. Um, If you, uh, you know, abruptly lose 
uh, blood flow to your leg, like a cold leg, we call it, um, cold arm, cold, really anything, <laughs> you know. Um, so that's a rush to go to surgery. Yes, that's not, yeah. you cannot say tomorrow morning. Exactly. Yeah. Because that could be result in limb loss. Um, obviously, rupture, mesenteric ischemia can result in death. Stroke can result in death. So there are many, many um, innate emergencies for vascular surgery. But then we talk about the iatrogenic injuries, like, you know, cardiologist does something, uh, you know, uh -huh. the other specialties might get into bleeding in the operating room. And so that's when we get called for other specialties. So you talk about emergency, but the flip side of this is you really save lives. And there's so many advancements in the field of vascular surgery. What excites you? Um, oh, there's so many exciting things. So the field of vascular surgery, why I love it is it's so diverse. It's so different. You know, the cases are so different from each other. I mean, you can go from something very elective to something very emergent, like we talked about, but also the technology. I mean, just in the last, you know, couple of years, we've had, um, you know, the carot the hybrid carotid stent, what we call the Silk Road T -cord. What is it? That is um, where instead of doing a carotid stent from the groin, you can do a small little cut down on the neck and stent that way. And so that's, you know, another part of our toolbox to treat carotid disease. Um, you know, here at Houston Methodist, which what is very exciting is that we are starting a vascular robotics program led by my partner, Dr. Char Bavari, who has done many, many cases. And so that's something that nobody has done in the country. They do it sparingly in Europe. Um, there's one or two people that do it very well. But other than that, that is something that's very leading edge, you know, in terms of vascular surgery. It's exciting because it can make what is traditionally a very big operation and no way out of not getting that big operation into small little laparoscopic incisions. For example, you know, any order of bifemoral bypass. So that is, you know, very new. Um, and we are, you know, already advancing in that significantly. Our residents and fellows are extremely excited to be a part of that as well. Um, and so we look forward to what that brings. So tell me a little bit about uh, robotics in surgery. That's uh, in general, a very exciting and a yes. re relatively recent development. So when I was trained, you know, as a surgeon, everything yeah. was open or laparoscopic, mm -hmm. but not robotic. And right. today, a lot of the procedures in different specialties are done by robots. Right. How do you view this evolution and do you embrace it? And what are the pros and cons of it? Yeah, so I definitely embrace it. Um, and many other fields, uh, just like your uh, previous guest, like urology, that that field, you know, I mean, in terms of prostatectomies, big operations, they do it robotically. Um, I think robotics brings, you know, a skill set that is much different when I'm talking about vascular surgery. But the visualization of your anatomy and the patient is better than even open, believe it or not. I mean, you can look so close at what's bleeding. It's it's incredible. And just the fact that you have a 360, you know, rotation of, of what is your hands, which is the robot hands, so that you can do things that you couldn't even do with, you know, your real hands. So it's, it's really cool. Um, and patient satisfaction is great because they they get this operation that otherwise would be a humongous surgery, lots of post-operative pain, increased length, length of stay, and they're not in that much pain. They get to go home the next day. Fantastic. This yeah. is really, you know, for me, it's like the future and it's very exciting for mm -hmm. our patients. And I know Houston Methodist is le leading the w way and I'm yeah. looking forward to, to hear more about it. Yeah. Let me ask you a little bit about, you know, for our viewers, what would be your advice how to make it into a field that is surgical, that is still manly dominated? How do, how to, if you, if you had to uh, make some suggestions, let's say you're a medical student and you don't know, you want to go to surgery, but you're not sure. What, what would be your advice? Definitely find yourself a mentor. Okay. So that's important to kind of get as much viewpoint as you can on the field that you're interested in. Um, and anybody can be your mentor, right? I mean, it doesn't have to just be a vascular surgeon, other surgeons, just so you can see what that the, that field of surgery looks like. Um, you definitely have to put in your time. And so if you are interested in that, you got to show up, be there, be visible. Um, 
ask intelligent questions, maybe not too many questions, um, but really read the room that you're in. Um, so, you know, I have one med student who shows up to conference every Thursday. You know, he wants to do vascular surgery. Um, he keeps in touch with me. You know, he's going to be following us this week. So, you know, that makes him like, oh, he's on my radar, right? Like always keeping in touch and showing his interest. And so that's, those are some of the tips that I would give the audience if they were looking to go into surgery. And would you recommend that field? If you had to choose again, would you go again? Vascular surgery? Yes. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's, you know, it can be tiring. It can be, um, you know, very humbling a lot of days. But then some days you leave and you're like, well, I really made a difference. Or I really, you said, save lives. Like, I've really saved life today. And like, there's nothing better than like saying that to yourself. And like, I made a difference, you know, like I made this person's life better. So I would say absolutely. And tell me about you, how you uh, function as a mentor. So you do many things. You have to take yeah. care of your patients, you have to take care of your home and your your uh, husband and, and little girl. Mm -hmm. How do you make time for your mentees? Well, a lot of it is in the operating room. So, you know, just being with them in surgery um, and then also giving them opportunities. So if there's something that comes up that I can't do, right, or that somebody wants a resident, I always think, okay, what about my mentees, right? So giving them an opportunity to shine um, and also just leading by example, like never doing something that I wouldn't want them to do so that they can see, OK, well, you know, if she's doing it that way, that's how I'm going to do it. So you also serve on national societies. Yes. Tell me a little bit about that service. Uh, so there's many vascular societies. There's the major national society and then the regional societies and then um, a subspecialty societies like American Venus Forum. So I've um, a member of many of them and I serve on uh, cer certain committees. Uh, we rotate every couple of years. They're always looking for volunteers. So that's sort of my part of trying to help nationally um, push forward, you know, push vascular surgery forward. Um, it's been, you know, great. I've done the public outreach, professional public outreach committee. I've done postgraduate committees, diversity committees, resident committees. So there's a lot of opportunity out there too to help um, within your society. And you have fellows that you uh, mentor here? Yes, I have fellows and residents um, because we have a fellowship and an integrative vascular residency. How many? Uh, mentors for me or how? No, how many residents do we have uh, oh. rotating with you? Okay, so we have 10 integrative vascular residents and two fellows usually. Um, and then many other outside rotators from general surgery, plastics, ortho, etc. And these are female, males? Um, males and females, both. And yeah. do you feel that they treat you differently? You know, kind of females gravitating towards you, kind of getting your advice more than the males, or it doesn't matter? It's, no, it doesn't matter. I mean, you know, my mentees currently right now are, are my two female, my female resident and my female fellow. But no, it doesn't matter. I've never felt um, any less respect for my male residents. In fact, I, I always feel like they're so supportive. Like they back me up when there's some sort of, if there was ever sort of issue where they feel like, oh, I was mistreated because of my gender, like that's unfair, you know. Did that and happen? It has, it definitely has. Um, surprisingly or not surprisingly, you know, many times it's, it's the patients. Um, obviously my, uh, long time patients don't. But, uh, you know, if I meet somebody new or there's a new consult, if there's a male resident there and he or, she, uh, you know, he looks older, they think I'm the resident and that they're the faculty. And so that's happened a few times. And so my my male resident will always be like, no, she's my boss, you know, like <laughs> she's my, you know, and so it's so I've never felt that, you know, they really do support me and, and they they draw the line like that's my boss. So you need to talk to her. So, yes. So, Dr. Lay, I, I know you're very busy and you don't have a lot of extracurricular activities except going to the Astros game with me tonight. Absolutely, yes. Thank you so much for being our guest today. I had a great time. Thank you for having me. It was a wonderful experience and great show. Thank you. And thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Join us next time, too.